My guest today is Keith Casey. Keith, how are you? I'm pretty good. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. It's been a long time since I've seen you, and I, I think you have a new job since last time we spoke. Tell me about it. Yeah, I was, I was trying to think. I bet the last time we saw each other was like that conference 2019. Yikes. Uh, yeah, so the world's changed a little bit since then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I left Okta. I've been over in Ingrock now for almost a year and a half. Uh, Ingrock, we are a platform for giving you secure access into any environment you're working in. Um, so I'm on the, the product marketing team and uh, a lot of developer evangelism, advocacy, blog posts, presentations, all the fun things that make that up. Very cool. I discovered Ingrock a few years ago. Um, I was using it for testing APIs, trying to t test them locally, I think was the, the use case that I used. Uh, but, but tell us, for people that aren't familiar, what is Ingrock? What does it do? Yeah, so uh, what it is, is it's a little agent that sits on your machine and it opens up your local environment to the world via URL. So behind the scenes, what it's doing is it, uh, when you're running your local app on port 80 or 3001 or whatever, you start your app and then Ingrock, you tell the Ingrock agent, open an HTTP tunnel to this port. And then it uses a reverse proxy out to our cloud and then connects a URL in front of that. So now you have a URL that maps through the Ingrock cloud, through the agent, back to your machine. So when you're building something, you want to be able to show it to the world. In about 10 characters, you can go ahead and open that up, and now you've got a URL you can share with your friends and see how things are working. Yeah, it, essentially it turns your local machine into a web server, right? Because it points, it tricks the internet into thinking you're a, you're a public web server. Yeah, yeah, it, is, it effectively does that. So it handles all the, the like TLS, SSL, all the DNS, all that fun stuff behind the scenes. Uh, it negotiates all the NAT traversals sort of crap and figures out how to map that. Um, and what's, what gets to be really fun about that is that once you've got that connectivity, you've got that URL that maps to your local machine, you can start layering things on top of it. So you can say, I want an identity provider. You can set up Active Directory or Google or Okta as your identity provider. You could say, I'm using webhooks, so I want to do webhook verification, and you could turn that on. Um, and all these things are just available out of the box. Yeah, that is very cool. Uh, now, now um, I just recently learned after talking to you that Ingrock does more than just this one product that you're talking about. There's a whole suite of things that they're doing. Tell me about some of that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, it all starts with connectivity. And once you've got connectivity and uh, Ingrock has control over that tunnel, what you can do with it is now you can put those security protocols in place. So you could say, um, let's support HTTP basic auth, or you can add in OAuth uh, as your identity server or at, at your identity provider. You can go ahead and you start putting IP restrictions in place to sort of lock down that access. But then that's really on the, the user side of things. If you want to move over to like the machine, the operational side of things, you can put things like mutual TLS. So you can have like a point to point, usually a machine oriented connection for like an API really easily. Uh, we also do fun things like load balancing. So if you've got a whole bunch of servers that are making up that cluster, we can handle the load balancing for you. And then circuit breaking in case a server gets a little bit out of sync. So uh, a little bit of a preview next week, we're launching our Kubernetes ingress controller uh, where you've got all that capabilities now with Ingrock built into your Kubernetes cluster. Interesting. Um, let's talk a little about webhooks because I noticed that you've got a site up here called webhooks.fyi. And I also yes. learned a new thing. I didn't know that FYI was a top level domain, but uh, well, maybe for I'll your grab information, one. it is. <laughs> yeah, now I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when we started building, uh, adding some of the security controls on top of the Ingrock tunnel, uh, webhook verification was one of the easy, obvious ones for us to do. If you look at any webhook guide out there, any API provider, uh, Twilio, Stripe, Slack, Teams, um, just about anyone, the top 150, if you go to their guide on webhooks, step one is go create an Ingrock account. Step two is come back and read the rest of this guide. So it was wild how many people um, come to us with webhook problems. We get, I don't know, 4,500 people signing up a day, and the vast majority of them are doing something with webhooks. And so what we were doing is we, we wanted to put more security controls in place for those people. And so last, well, a year and a half ago now, right when I first started in Ingrock, we said, okay, well, how are people handling webhook verification? Because hey, just can, because can, you, we, can I stop you a second here? Can you yeah. define webhook? What is that? Yeah, yeah. So webhook is basically um, 
if you're familiar with the, the object-oriented principle of message passing, message passing from an object-oriented perspective is when objects change state, they need to notify each other. Okay. Because you don't want to have to worry about the internal implementation of the different things. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like a, a credit card transaction, changing state from uh, confirmed to paid, well, there are systems that want to know that that happened. So that message passing idea of saying this credit card transaction has changed from confirmed to paid is communicated across the wire in some way. When we're looking at object-oriented programming, that's probably done in memory from a local system. When we're looking at webhooks, it's the exact same thing, except we're communicating with nodes that are potentially thousands of miles apart. And so webhooks is the concept of that message passing, the same principle we've always had before, but now using HTTP and using JSON to communicate the change of state. So if you had a credit card, you, it might be this change from confirmed to paid. If you had a text message from Twilio, the fact that you got this message was would be a notification. Teams or Slack, you might say a new message came in or a user signed on. Basically, something in st system A changed state, and now we're telling system B about it. And system God. B might care about that and take action. It might not. So it's a method for communicating events through HTTP. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, and it's it's really, I, I think the the unrealized power of webhooks is the fact that it's all JSON or XML over mm -hmm. HTTP. So you don't have to be tied into a particular tech stack or particular language or framework or infrastructure. Everyone, I mean, every modern web developer probably knows some HTTP. They probably know some JSON. And so it just works. And that's kind of the magic behind it. Yeah. And every platform and every language understands that as well. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you're not working in HTTP at this point, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, all right. Sorry to interrupt, but I thought that was an important no, uh, no, definition no, great. to throw out there. Uh, you were saying. Yeah. So when you've got that change in state coming across the system, thinking of that, that credit card transaction, you know, if you get a notification from Stripe of, hey, Keith has paid his his shopping cart. You're, you're safe to ship these items now. Well, that's a really high trust interaction. You want to have confidence that when you get that message saying Keith has paid for his, his order, that that message actually came from Stripe. So we've got the concept of webhook verification. The idea of let me make sure that I know who sent this. Let me definitively prove that this message came from Stripe and the message wasn't tampered with. So we think a webhook verification, that's what we're doing. We're saying we're proving the identity or the source of the webhook, and we're confirming the payload to make sure it hasn't been modified or tampered with in some way. Okay. So when we started building this into Ingrock, uh, I and a, another gentleman, we started compiling this list of all these different webhook providers and how each one approached verification. And uh, when we tackled the first 50, you might be amused by that. If there are... 50 different webhook providers, how many verification methods do you think there are? Uh, 50? 50, correct. Is that right? <laughs> everyone, everyone approaches it the same way. Once we got out to about 120, 130, we started finding some duplicates. But realistically, everyone approaches it their own way. Uh, and some of those ways- reinventing the wheel though, for this it, common problem. Yes, everyone's doing it. And they some of them are subtle differences. Some of them are- uh, when you generate a signature, like a, a signature to verify this this payload hasn't been tampered with, some use um, uppercase names and some use lowercase names and some alphabetize the parameters. Like there's little differences like that that right. functionally aren't a big deal. But when you're actually building this out, it's a pain in the butt to track all those differences down. So right. anyway, we we had accumulated all these. We accumulated about 100 or so different webhooks that we were looking at. We were looking to implement in Ingrock. We implemented 50 of those. So we have 50 different implementations. Um, but what Fred and I realized is that we had collected this awesome about, amount of information, all this stuff that really no one had ever organized before. And there was no directory for it. And so we thought, well, wait a minute. We know webhooks now better than just about everyone out there. Let's go ahead and put this all together in a site. So we launched webhooks.fyi. It's uh, available free on GitHub. Um, it's very lightly branded Ingrock. Uh, we have an open repository, pull request welcome. And what we did with it was we organized all this information. Then we started tearing down the approaches to say, here are some good approaches you should emulate. Here are some bad approaches that you should stop doing. <laughs> 
What now? Who's the target audience for this site? Are the uh, people that are building the webhooks or people that are consuming the webhooks? Both, both. So we have best practices for people consuming and for people building. Um, what we found is that a lot of people, when they when they do API design in general, they don't just most don't just make things up. They go and they see who else is doing what. And so we wanted a central repository so that when people are building webhooks, hopefully they adopt better patterns. And on the flip side, when you're consuming webhooks, you need to have some security in place to understand, is this information correct? Is it coming from a trusted party? All those sorts of things. Uh, I see. So I'm, I'm looking at the site right now, and I see a whole section on security. And then it looks like you have different types of security, like one-time verification versus shared secret versus uh, asymmetric keys and so on. Uh, but what I don't see is how to choose between these methods. Which one is the best for me, for my situation? So that's one of the fun things. It's, uh, it really depends on the security of the situation. So if you, you're, you're going for a very simple, low security kind of effort, a, like a shared secret is probably sufficient. So companies like uh, Twilio do a shared secret. So you've got, when you send a text message with Twilio, you have an, a, what's called an account ID and an auth token. So the auth token is effectively your account API password. So you use that as a shared secret to verify the um, payload of messages coming in. So that's a real simple, like low security, low complexity way of approaching it. On the higher end, we've got HMAC, which is a hash-based message authentication code. I think that's it. I believe um, right now it is. <laughs> all right, nailed it. Um, and that that's more complex, but you end up with different safeguards. So you can... Um, you can go ahead and put a lot more information in it. You've got, uh, it's easier to rotate because now there's just a key. Like there's a public key that you're probably using to verify, yes, this message was signed by the party I was expecting it to. And now you don't have a shared secret. So a shared secret works really well when you've got control over both endpoints. But if you're just broadcasting messages out and you don't necessarily have control over the endpoints, you probably want to go to like more of an HMAC approach where there's a there's a key that people could verify it's from you, but you're not okay. having to publish a secret for them. I see. And I'm now drilling down a little further into it. And I see that when I click on uh, HMAC or asymmetric keys, there actually is a section that does, that compares the two. When should you use this? Which is yeah. really the question I was asking earlier, which is which. And they also have uh, complexity. Yes. Low, medium, high, uh, somewhere in between, which uh, equates to me, how much work do I want to do to maintain this thing? You know, is it is it a one-time only thing or I'm going to build a, an enterprise system that's going to cover oh, life and death data that can never leak out? Yeah, exactly. And uh, one of the things I always nudge people on is that a lot of people are implementing uh, internal webhook systems. So they've got things that are communicating entirely inside their organization. And they, they're like, oh, well, I trust both the, the sender and the receiver, so I don't have to bake in security. And I really warn people on that to at least right. have some sort of verification because all it takes is your product being successful and now some customer or some partner wants to use that system and now you don't trust the other end. Sure, or they trick somebody internally into acting on their behalf. Yes, yes, Which I may a... have done that once or twice. <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a common, uh, common attack vector. Uh, and I, I see down here uh, as a whole section on best practices, both for providers and for consumers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So we want to, our entire goal with this is to improve the ecosystem. And so we call out a lot of patterns that are uh, good and we should have replicate. So one, um, one of the places that most providers screw up is they don't have sample code showing how to verify their webhook. Mm -hmm. They they have a bulleted list of steps, but they don't actually show it in in. Uh, in action. And it doesn't take much to be able to do that. I'm Odds are that provider implemented it to test it, right? right. Copy and sure. paste that code. Show us how it works. Because if you can give me something in JavaScript or Python or you know whatever, mm -hmm. I can go ahead and say, okay, cool. Now I know what to do and I can transpose it to whatever language I need. But show me functional code. Let me, let me do something that works with it. Um, I appreciate are, that as well as a developer. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much, I mean, we, we always say pictures worth a thousand words and I think a code is just as valuable. And just seeing it in action, knowing this bit of code actually works, I can trust it, I can run it. 
I, I think that goes really far. Um, and then the other thing we, we see a lot of is that uh, their documentation is terrible. It's stunning how many organizations actually don't have much information on their webhooks. Like they don't document their security practices or they don't document what the payload is going to look like. If you're trying to use a webhook, the number one thing you want to understand is what's in it. Like that's a, that's a very baseline table stakes kind of question. And probably half the providers we looked at didn't actually have a sample payload. And that's mm. just frustrating as crap. Yeah, I think uh, there's a, uh, too many places to think of documentation as a, an afterthought. We'll get to that when everything else is done. And if the problem with that is, of course, that never happens that everything else is done. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the thing I find the most irritating about it is that at some point, well, the main time people use your documentation is when they're they're figuring out does your system solve my problem, right? Or they're trying to actually put something about your system in in production, or they've hit a problem. Those are three times where having good documentation would really help. It would right. it would drive the it would potentially drive a sale. It could drive adoption. Sure. People just don't care. Uh, yeah, they they well, they don't recognize the importance of it until yeah, until they lose a sale or until they get complaints or I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So uh, best practices. Uh, I see under learn more you've got standardization efforts, which you said initially, fifty providers, fifty different standards. Clearly, that's not happening now, but there is a few steps moving in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm. Some of these are really interesting. They have. Um, like the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, mm -hmm. actually has a, a working group on this that they're they're doing a number of different things. Um, mm -hmm. I believe they've started using this site for kind of a uh, what it, things look like in the wild. But oh, more cool. than anything, we just want to call attention to some of these efforts. And if we can provide data to some of these, I think it's great. We actually talked to um, the OpenID Foundation has a thing on shared signals and events is their approach on it. We've talked with them and said, hey, look, we've accumulated all this data, all this information, can you use it? And they they thanked us for it. And they I don't know if they're using it, but um, I, I love seeing more and more efforts like this sort of coordinating and sharing information. Yeah. Uh, I, I like your efforts to kind of nudge folks in the right direction. <laughs> if the open ID people are, are working on it, help them. Put, put, push, show, share with them what you've done. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, they, they've got leverage and credibility that we don't have but if we can get them useful actionable information of this is what happens in the field right now hopefully they'll make better decisions with it this is a lot of information and a lot of useful information i'm, I'm certainly learning a lot is there something anything that we haven't talked about that we should have oh geez on <laughs> ingrock on webhooks on uh where do you want to go from here i can go uh, anywhere <laughs> uh let's let's Table that for the next conversation, if we want to right. dive deep into some aspect of NGROC. But uh, right now, I think it's a good place to wrap up. And Keith, I really appreciate your time. You stay safe. Yeah, thank you. You too. So it's, it's funny when uh, we're thinking about technology and friends, uh, I was thinking about what I was going to say here. I turn to some of my friends and I say, hey, what should I say about this? And I realized that the vast majority of my friends, I've met through the tech communities, through these different things, um, like some of my closest inner circle. And now that I live out here in the middle of the woods, it, like those friendships and those relationships have been even better. So uh, I've made some great friends. I look forward to making some more friends through tech community and technology itself. Thank you. <laughs>